am going to read two sections of the book. I sort of chose them uh, to speak to the spirit of the award. So they kind of address both the medical instances, but also sort of how they intertwine with uh, family aspects. Um, I got to set it up a little bit. Uh, so the, the medical instance at the, at, the, at, the, at the heart of this book happened to me when I was 24 years old. Um, and I got a headache that I thought was a migraine. So I went to the ER and was informed that A, I had a tumor on my pituitary gland and had for about a year and a half. And as a result of that, uh, the tumor had sort of kinked the hose of my hormone distribution and sort of incrementally raised human growth hormone output, uh, which is a condition called acromegaly. So that was news bit number one. Uh, news bit number two was that it had exploded uh, and uh, completely shorted out my pituitary gland, uh, which meant that I learned that I had lived with too many hormones and then now at 24, uh, I would have to live for the rest of my life without any hormones whatsoever. Um, so the book kind of straddles both the sides of the condition, what it was like to sort of discover that you had too many hormones and then what it was like to live with none of them. And in the middle, what happens is that my mother also sort of entered into an extended bout of medical catastrophes uh, that were all heart related and escalating. Um, so we sort of entered into this weird competitive illness situation. That's what you need to know. Uh, I'm gonna read from the first chapter, which is called The Drowning Lifeguard. A few months after my diagnosis, I stood next to my mother in my parents' kitchen, our backs against the sink counter. It was 1.37 a.m. In one hand, she held a half-empty glass of iced Pinot Grigio. In the other, an unashed cigarette. It was the first I'd seen her since my hospital stay, and my mother had some pointed feedback on the affair. You scared the shit out of me, she said. I know, I told her. You just said that. You don't understand, she said. No. Mom, I do. Her face was crumpled as if she were about to sneeze. No, you don't, she said. She waved her cigarette in front of herself like a conductor's baton. You scared the shit out of me. Some blurred version of my mother, petite, nervous, with straw blonde hair and a frame I've often heard her describe accurately as bony, exists in my childhood recollections as a resourceful, devoted, and generally happy parent. But that person was replaced in my adult years by someone new to me, someone who seemed content to be the, de content to be the defeat defeated product of her snowballing illnesses. Every few months throughout my early 20s, doctors found her on the verge of some grand cardiopulmonary event, a fact she'd remind me of in these late night hours, her head down and forlorn, repeating it until the whine and worry finally drove her eyes closed which was why visits home became attempts at tactful avoidance. 12.30 a.m. was usually late enough to find her passed out next to my father on the living room couch. He snoring, she sitting upright, mouth wide, television flickering. But there were still nights like tonight when there was no dodging the slow tack of her walk, the record skip of utterances that never found their way to her lips during the day. You just made jokes in that hospital, she said. She was almost crying now. Her teeth were clenched. Had yourself a good old time, she said. You scared the shit out of me. I know, I said, I'm sorry. No, no, Michael, no, she said. And she exhaled and closed her eyes, and held her arm in the air as if hailing a cab and then swatted it down. You scared the shit out of me, and so on. What she may have been referring to the secret ambulance from the Brooklyn Training Hospital delivered me to the brain trauma wing of a far more impressive facility in Upper Manhattan. Within hours, I met Dr. Brian Elmer, a tall bespectacled neurosurgeon and his band of underlings who spread themselves in a silent crescent at the foot of my bed. My parents stood along the wall, my father heavy-lidded, my mother by his side, itchy-seeming, picking at her teeth with the folded cellophane from her soft pack of Marlboro lights. The removal of the mass will leave a space inside your head, Dr. Elmer said, right behind the eyeballs. Of course, we'll have to fill that. The underlings nodded and scribbled notes. They were all assured and male, no more than a few years older than I was, which might have been why they later called me man 
buddy or dude while administering tests or loosen their protocol when discussing the likelihood of post-op post complications. Totally minuscule, they said. The rupture had swollen my brain, so they had given me Decadron, a pill that warded off the ache and swelling with a stunning efficiency. I was clear now, alert. What, I asked Dr. Elmer, will you fill the space in my head with? Fat deposits, he said. We'll either take them from the side of your leg or the back of your thigh. Back of my thigh, I said. You mean my ass? <laughs> well, he said, the back of your thigh. <laughs> uh, so you mean my ass, I said. Sure, OK, he said. But we'll likely take the fat from the side of your leg. No, I said to him and then to everyone, take it from my ass. <laughs> I want my ass in my head. <laughs> One of the underlings let out a mini snort. My father gasped shithead like he'd arrived at the answer of a long unsolved riddle. As I spat out something half-baked about wanting, wanting a bona fide excuse for all future mistakes, my mother exhaled and chomped down on a fingernail. Shit for brains, I told Dr. Elmer. Say you can make that happen. I drove my orderlies weary with a line I'd beat to death in the coming years. We're going to take some quick blood samples, they'd say. We'll make it quick, I'd tell them. My head's about to explode. I entered in. These jokes aren't great. <laughs> I entered into an over-under game with my pleasant Dominican-sounding nurse, Avis, regarding how many bad rental car jokes she'd heard from patients during her rounds. Avis, I'd say, so what are we at now, three? Depends, she'd say. Does this count as one? The morning after I arrived, three days into the affair, Avis wheeled me to the visual field test station, located almost like a closet in the back room of the hospital's nursery. I'd taken my first VFT while still in Brooklyn, still under the unbearable throttle of my apoplexy. The pulse of the swollen tumor had pushed against the backs of my eyeballs, cloaking my periphery in waves of dense, cloud-like illumination. I saw only what was directly in front of me. Now. Post-decadron, I pressed my face against that set of closed binoculars with a painless clarity and renewed vigor. Spots of light appeared on a blackened backdrop for me to pinpoint to the left, lower left, <coughs> upper right, etc., and I pounced on them. The technician, a soft-spoken woman named Jean, who appeared to be in her late 40s, ambled into a conversation. You still in college? Just got out in January. Upper left. Ah, well, that's nice. My parents would certainly agree, I said. I was on what they like to call the 5.5 year plan. <laughs> upper right, upper right. We moved on to small talk about hopes and career intentions that I'd come to find grading and learn to avoid after six months of complete unemployment in New York. But with my head clear, every familiar thing felt like a reward. Jean said she had a daughter a few years younger than me who was thinking about being an English major like I'd been. I told her I hadn't had a job in six months, left, lower, right, and that she should double major in something useful and employable. How about neurosurgery? Right, <laughs> lower, left. And then I reeled off canned one-liners about head explosions and shit for brains. Left, upper left. My operation was the next morning. So that afternoon, my mother, father, and I sat subdued in my hospital room, quietly watching a repeat marathon of the Thomas Crown Affair on the tiny television that hung over my bed like a crane arm. My mother was talking about how superior the original 1968 version was, how it was the first movie she and my father had seen together when they began dating in high school, when Jean, the VFT tech, arrived at my room she placed a plastic bag on the swivel tray next to that day's empty dinner plate. Inside the bag was a box of green and blue thatched stationery and three matching steel pens. So you can do your writing, Jean said. And then she leaned in for a light, careful hug. My mother spent the rest of that evening lapsing into sobs while playing Trivial Pursuit to pass time. She chain smoked on the curb of the hospital valet. According to later reports from my father, she made demanding, unsuccessful calls to her sister in New Jersey. I need you here. 
then spent the remaining nights of my hospital stay awake well into the morning hours, flooding my overheated railroad apartment with hovering layers of cigarette smoke, perhaps recalling her own memories of hospitals, and thinking, with good reason, is he actually enjoying this? All right, so that's the first thing we're gonna reread to get a sense of my mother <laughs> in me, I guess. Um, so I'm gonna move ahead to a section that uh, takes place about two months after I get out of the hospital, after I have no hormones, after I'm sort of grappling with both sides of this condition. Um, the thing you need to know here is that acromegaly is Greek for uh, large extremities. So people who have sort of GH secretions uh, sort of suffer a very slow incremental expansion of their hands and feet. Um, the, the temples tend to cave in, the jaw expands, the tongue expands, and it happens at such a slow rate that almost nobody detects it. Uh, it's usually diagnosed uh, in people 49 to 53, usually after they go to a new doctor who doesn't have a visual history with their own face. So that's sort of the kind of, I don't know, sneaky way that, that acromegaly can kind of present itself. The earliest published memoir of life as an acromegalic is 1912's Acromegaly, A Personal Experience, written by Dr. Leonard Mark, who, in his 70s, set to pinpoint the origin of his own pituitary tumor. Not just when it formed, but when his growth hormone secretions began to contort him. Structured almost like a medically verified captain's log, Mark became a doctor in part to understand what had happened to him the book works as, as a detective story of self, with Mark recalling his memories or trips he took and the headaches or body abnormalities that accompanied them. Lethargy, face ache, noises in the head. It's a staggered anecdotal investigation into the trail of the disease. For 15 to 20 years, he writes, each day when I looked into the glass to brush my hair or shave, there was a typical acromegaly, typical acromegalic literally staring me in the face, yet I never recognized that fact. And though Mark states up front that it's well known how fallacious the accounts given by a patient of his own symptoms may be, it doesn't stop him from digging through and excerpting personal diaries dating back to his teens, <laughs> assembling charts of his skull shape, speculating about when in his life the tumor first appeared. By Dr. Mark's estimations, it was at age 24. My own journal, as a 24-year-old acromegalic, was tiny and spiral-bound. I carried it in my backpack to work on the subway and to lunch after my tumor's rupture, cracking it open to a clean page, pen in hand, and failing to produce a single word. In those first two months, the only thing I wrote wasn't even writing at all. It was a sketch, a replica of Kurt Vonnegut's drawing of a beaver from the early pages of Breakfast of Champions, a crude, buck-toothed, possum-looking thing that, in the, absence, in the absence of more substantive material, I thought might be fun to draw. I could think of no words to describe how or what I felt then because there wasn't much to describe. When someone asked me, what's that like each day with the fake hormones? I said the same thing every time. It feels like being a left foot stuck in a right-footed shoe because that sounded to me like what having synthetic hormones pump pump through your blood should have felt like. But the truth, and what I was almost too ashamed to tell anyone then, was that it felt like absolutely nothing. Which, of course, was entirely the point. The goal was to return my wayward endocrine system to a full, healthy baseline, to make me just like every other person who walked New York City's sidewalks. At full dosage, my perceptions, metabolism, and reflexes chugged at the same rate and strength as everyone else's, as they had before my symptoms had appeared. I often felt like I was sick in name only. But what had happened to me, the rupture, and what was happening still, the cleaning of its mess, wasn't standard or ignorable. And in the short months since my operation, there grew in me an unexpected impatience, almost a longing. I'd been impaled with needles, gauged on treadmills, sliced up and stuffed with leg fat, told by astute and impressively degreed professionals that I lacked ingredients essential to my lifeblood. And part of me yearned to feel as torn through as I was told I was now. 
I wanted to sense the extent of the damage, the trace of its shape. I often thought of the nights after her first heart procedures when my mother would sequester herself on the back porch of my family's house in Pittsburgh, wine-soaked, piling kinked butts into ashtrays as my father, brother, and I moved across the floor of the house like a shark's remora, glancing through the window as we passed, moving around my mother but never toward her, wary of being pulled into her low atmosphere. I thought of the nights during my last months in Pittsburgh in college when the phone would ring in my apartment, usually well past 10 o'clock, a quiet hold of seconds, before a version of my mother's voice emerged, then tumbled into the beats and themes of her last phone call and the one before that, loose aching hems and haws about whatever artery renovations were on tap in the coming weeks and months. I don't think I can do it again, she'd tell me. The calls would last hours and go nowhere. Sometimes I'd snap back at her. You gotta quit talking like that. But more often, I, say, I stayed silent on the line as she rolled around in the same phrases, in the same guilt, the same defeat, exasperating us both. OK, mom. OK, I'd say, please, get some sleep. I was so overcome by resentment after those calls, turned livid by the way my mother seemed easily to give over to what I saw as a bullshit fa failure narrative. But in this fresh era of hormonelessness, I began in a very faint way to envy my mother's sullen intimacy with her body's breakdowns, her ability to snatch them up and lock them in her brain, commune with them even, her constant resigned retreads building into their own brand of anti-mantra. For all the bravado I showed in public, the shit jokes, the wit of character, in my private moments I couldn't lock onto a single thread of insight or introspection about anything. On a weekday, at a bookstore a few blocks from my house, there was no counseling from experienced people whatsoever about a how-to book on meditation. The first one I saw that seemed simple, but the title like the novice's guide to inner balance. The next night I folded my legs into a lotus cross on the warped hardwood of our apartment and attempted as the manual instructed to shut my mind off and breathe, to disconnect my brain from my body, and so on. But I was far too self-conscious, even at home, even alone, there was no shutting off or unplugging from one prevailing thought. What the fuck am I doing right now? And though I tried again and again, I abandoned each session, nagged by the worry that I was, after all that had happened, a poser, a loudmouth paper champ of my own rare illness. Then there was the matter of my appearance, which my doctors told me had changed, which articles that friends and aunts and cousins had sent me told me distorted my temples, brow, and jawline, and plump into my hands and hardened my skin. But as with Dr. Leonard Mark, I saw none of it. Not, not as it was happening, not when my doctors measured the changes right in front of my eyes, and certainly not now, two months later, when my mother, taking a welcome break from the kind of conversations I'd been used to having with her, became excited about the realm of pituitary abnormality, at least as much as her cable package permitted when she called now, it was well before 10, and the voice on the line was quick and fascinated, playfully urgent, alive in the world of my illness in a way I couldn't seem to be. Quick, quick, she'd say, your tumor's on TV. I turn on my television. On the Discovery Channel, or TLC, or a channel just like it, was a pseudo-documentary, an expose on medical hiccups rare and unexplained, featuring a mid-30s woman living in Memphis, Small, blonde, and angled, fat hands, brow hovering over her eyes like an awning, who'd gone months without her period. Fearing she might be pregnant, she'd visited her primary care therapist. Then, after that, an OBGYN, who'd referred her to an endocrine doctor who took a look at her temples and forearms and scheduled, scheduled the girl for a tumor removal in two months' time. This gave the producers of that program the opportunity to take a break from the girl's own burgeoning narrative as an acromegalic to explain the long history of the disease, a Ken Burns-type photo swirl of oblong heads and bent bodies from many decades or centuries past, sepia tone forms twisted into something resembling punctuation, all men, all of them barrel-chested, facial contours bulbous and exaggerated, wide fleshy mitts, gnarled back curves, my mother and I watched quietly together, 
the audio on her TV in Pittsburgh and echo through the receiver as the program flashed forward to more recent coverage of the, of the featured young woman's own shape, modern, full color this time, Dorothy and Oz. There were medical mug shots, both, both face forward and profiled. The woman stripped pale to her bra and saggy underwear, graphic lines appearing on screen to highlight her concavities, the shifts in her posture. And then, soon enough, the operating room shot. Surgeons ringed around the woman's split open face. And yep, there it was, round, red, and smooth, my tumor on TV. Thanks. Mike, thank you so much for that reading. Um, I'm a huge fan of this book. I remember when I first picked it up and opened it, and from the first few pages, I could tell it was a really special book. It's a book about illness that really invites you in. Um, it has a humor. It has inside jokes that you get to be close to and be a part of. Um, it has so much about the inner experience of illness, I think. Um, things that you could never get from a news article or a textbook or um, all of these more impersonal forms. Like, what it is to me is um, a medical memoir that really feels like it contains a whole person in it. Wow. You have company when you read it. Um, and I know that because, <laughs> because of that, because it feels so natural and um, so human, it must have taken a tremendous amount of work <laughs> over a great many years. <laughs> Don't shake your head. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about how this book started? Absolutely. Uh, well, I thought it might be fun to write, so I finished it over a weekend. Um, <laughs> I was a really reluctant memoirist. Um, and I think for the reasons that you're describing, the kind of the kind of work I really kind of gravita gravitated to is stuff that that, in, that invited you in, and, and and seemed to be like somebody who would sit down next to you at a bar and tell you a long yarn. Um, and the medical memoirs that I had known to that point, and I have to admit that before this all happened, and before I, I started taking the idea of writing about it seriously, that I wasn't a great reader of medical memoirs. And the reason being is it sort of scared me off, and I felt. Um, I felt trapped by them in a way that didn't make me feel like I was interacting with the writer in a way that was human. Mm. And that's my fault as a reader. So that was a sort of preconception that I had about medical memoirs. And I tried to access the story in various other ways. Um, at one point, it was a series of essays. At one point, it was a narrative biography of Andre the Giant that was sort of written um, it, uh, you know, it, at a limited first person distance. So I could sweep in and, and hopefully kind of like give Andre the Giant's life some, sh some shape. And I had the opportunity to sort of take a fellowship at Bucknell University in 2009 to sort of pursue that project and see if it would succeed. And it really did not in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. And there's a number of reasons for that. But um, half of it had to do with the fact that I thought what I could do was kind of Susan Orlean it mm -hmm. and be this really kind of smart sensibility that shapes another person's life. But the condition that we were writing about was so rare that it became an authority game. Mm -hmm. And I needed to move to the center in order to tell the story about the history of the condition that needed to be told. Uh, so when I realized that, I think I broke everything in the room and <laughs> just kind of like reset myself uh, I rededicated myself to figure out what, what a memoir was. And that was around uh, 2010. So between 2010 and 2012 was me sort of resetting the project and, and really kind of finishing it. And once I, once I realized that I needed to move to the center, um, then, then things came fairly quickly, I'd right. say. If, you know, in writer time, fairly quickly, two years. Yeah. yeah. That's quick for writers. Yeah, so that's, definitely. yeah. Um, but it was, it was a lot. It was a lot of mental work to get to that point. Um, it makes so much sense to me that you say that, though, because the center position you write from, you're able to draw in um, sort of the medical history of the condition in a way that's really effortless and natural. You're able to bring in your mother as a character who's kind of a counterpoint. Um, you're weaving these things in together. And I think that uh, part of the key effect of that is um, that we get to see this condition that it's so hard to pinpoint from inside it from all of these different perspectives. Almost like that tumor on, uh, on TV that you talk yeah, about yeah. in your reading. Um, what other 
how was it to interact with the sort of medical language about the condition while you were experiencing it yourself? It was really horrible. I just didn't do it. Um, I, I think it was like a mental block that while I was actually going through it, that, that I had to think of my, my body as a car that I was taking to a, a really good mechanic to get fixed. And so as a result, I probably wasn't the best patient because I wasn't, you know, some people, some, some people learn of their, their illness and immediately become a pundit for it. Mm -hmm. um, which I think, which it, it, my mother did, you know, and, and so there are a couple of complicated psychological things probably at play when I was like, well, I'm not going to do that if she does it. Um, <laughs> we're so weird, right? It's like we're just sick. Uh, so so I, I think, I think that there, there was part of me that was just sort of like, well, I've got specialists. They can worry about it. I'm young. I'll get through it, and that's mm -hmm. fine. Uh, but the story never left me alone, so when I had to return to it, I had to sort of like read up on all the stuff that I'd ignored while I was actually going through it, which was, it was a lot. Right. Yeah. There, there's this tug of war going on between the coming of age story that's there in this book um, and the development of the medical story, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. I, in, and I think, I think the easier parts for me to write were the, were the coming of age yeah. story. And I had, I had this fear, I had, I had this fear of the information, um, where it was, I felt like if I gave over to it, I would use it as a defense mechanism and not get to the real dramatic heart of the story. Um, so when it came time to access that information, I, it, it took a really hard time for me to get confident with what I wanted to do with it. Yeah. Um, and it actually required help. I needed to, to get somebody who was a fact checker who, who, who could actually work alongside me. And I would, you know, I would, write, you know, I wrote a number of passages and I would give it to her and be like, this is what I want to achieve with this scene. Am I arranging the medical information properly? And mm -hmm. she would write me back like a 15 page thing saying, no, you haven't. This is not right at all. <laughs> and like it was a former student of mine. And, and I think she really kind of relished just being like, oh, my former professor is an idiot, you know, and so uh, it was great. It was it was great having somebody call me on something, and, and it felt like I had a collaborator. Um, so that the, the medical aspects of it were, were um, and I, I still am not totally confident in those parts of the book. So uh, it's just it's out it's outside of my comfort zone in a way I don't think I'll ever get right with. I think doctors have a very special authority that that non-doctors can never quite approach. <laughs> right. I had a former student who was also a doctor, and um, everything she said in class and workshop, like I felt like I had to be like, that's a very good point. <laughs> yes, yes, it, and it sort of exposes like because I think we're always looking for the unanswerable question as mm -hmm. writers, and yes. doctors are not. They are trained to do the exact opposite. So yeah, I I am definitely uh, they're the alpha in the room, and I'm like. Okay, that sounds great. You've set the rules. You know? Yeah. Well, one of the things that really sticks out about this book, I think, in a good way, um, is that a lot of the the quotes on the back of it, including mine, seem very surprised to be reading a medical memoir that is so funny. <laughs> um, it's genuinely laugh out loud funny at many points, um, and I'm wondering why you feel that humor and illness um, are so rarely combined. Yeah, I think, okay, so I, I, I don't think that you can really sort of explore humor in a grave illness mm -hmm. in a way that, well, you can. I mean, it, but it's a different type of humor, and it doesn't really invite interaction. So um, the kind of thing, there were two things that, that, that challenged me with regards to the tone of this is that A, the facts of the matter were that I responded almost immediately to news of this condition with jokes. <laughs> Whether or not they were good, that would, so if I were to write those scenes, you have to sort of confront jokes, but also jokes that didn't work. Um, so there are two sort of, to write bad humor is actually really difficult because it's a, it's a special <laughs> kind of vulnerability. You have to sort of explain why it doesn't work. Um, which I didn't read tonight, all the ones I wrote worked, so, no. Um, so there was that one level of, of the, the person who was really sort of enacting a defense mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. And so I needed to sort of display that as somebody who was really displaying pathos. Uh, and then the other one, the other aspect of humor came with perspective when you just sort of look back and the only thing that makes sense is absurd, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it just becomes kind of crazy to you that 
you know, your body has done this thing that you're completely unaware of. You see it every day, and yet it has betrayed you. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, part of that is really insidious, but part of it is also kind of like, eh, you know? <laughs> and so you kind of go into those area, you know, into those situations and just highlight how strange they are. Um, you know, and just part of the social contract of being sick is, 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 um, is something that's really ripe for, um, for humor or for at least sort of skewering. And it was something that I really enjoyed is sort of taking a script that everybody knows and then disrupting the script, you know? Yeah. Um, and that, that's the kind of humor uh, that I think I really value in writing is where it's very structural, where, where you know, the writer is fully aware of, and you do this really well too, it, we're, we're, um, they're really aware of a, 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 of a coded structure that we all kind of agree on. And then you present that structure, and then you destabilize it. And it produces like a tension and release that makes the reader uncomfortable and, and, and really kind of reveals something about not just the character or the moment, but also them. Right. And that's what I was heading for. Yeah, definitely. And it also makes you as the reader go, why am I uncomfortable with this? You know, yeah. Why do I expect this story to be told one way with one emotional texture? Um, you know, if you had to live with the weight of one emotional texture, like the burden of illness 24 hours a day, m monotonously, yes. um, it's pretty hard to take. You want to, you want to take different angles on it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and I find myself just generally just be an arc person who, uh, just like a mild contrarian who kind of looks for ways to, <laughs> to just be a little bit of a jerk, um, for lack of a better term. But I, you know, I, the interesting thing about being sick is that. The, as you start to learn, you need to be sick for yourself, mm -hmm. which can be hard, but then you also have to be sick for other people in a way that doesn't challenge them. Mm -hmm. um, so navigating those two has pitfalls, and I was interested in the pitfalls, you know? Yeah. Um, one of the examples you sort of give early in the book is um, that when you start talking about an illness, you can immediately sense people taking this position of pity or something, and that's not the position you want them to take. That makes you want to wrap up your story right away. Right. Um, so humor is maybe a way to keep their attention, to keep the story sort of welcoming, even as it remains true to your experience. Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of, uh, once the pity moment happens, the interaction stops. Yeah. Because that's a shutdown moment for the person you're talking to. So if you really want them to pay attention to what's going on, you want to avoid that. And mm -hmm. um, I always thought it important to, to sort of mention that even though you might be going through a really high stakes, painful diagnosis or situation, there are everyday things that sort of creep their way into them. Uh, your breath might stink, you know, <laughs> and somebody might notice it. And to have that happen during the medical script, that we kind of all agree on um, really does something to an interaction that I, I was just really interested in. And then I started to connect it. Um, and w part of the research that I thought was really interesting when I started to look into acromegalyx and more, more importantly, public acromegalyx, uh, I started to ask the question of why did they do this? You know, you, you have this condition that, that everybody seems to agree is synonymous with ugly. Why do you make the choice to step into the spotlight with it? And what does that mean? Um, and my, my feeling about it was that those jokes that I told and the way I sort of kind of, you know, in those early years, early years tended to assault people with my illness story wasn't too far off from, say, you know, a seven foot 16 year old who's being approached to be a professional wrestler, wrestler like Andre the Giant was, or Eddie Carmel agreeing to sort of do a, a photo shoot with Deanne Arbus that would show in you know, museums around the country. Um, or Rondo Hatton, who was somebody who was in these sort of Ed Wood type movies in the 50s, pre-CGI, uh, which was sort of this complicated heyday for a lot of acromegalics who played ghouls in these movies. And it was always really interesting to me. Uh, and I think, if you have a condition that you know makes you a certain way, stepping into the spotlight is a way to take back control. Mm 
And I think that that's sort of what I was doing in those interactions where, uh, you know, the shit for brains kind of thing, where it was just sort of like, no, this isn't happening to me. You know, we're, we're both going through it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that. And I also think that it has a lot to do with um, destabilization, you know, making yeah. people feel uncomfortable and pushing the boundaries then of um, what they think they should be comfortable with, what they... <laughs> yeah, so you, what do you mean by this? In, this is, okay, so who has read Alexandra's novel, You Two Can Have a Body Like Mine? Okay, all right. So it sort of uh, follows the, 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 the sort of inner monologue of, of, of the narrator, A, uh, in, in a sort of triangle, you know, with her boyfriend C and her, in, in her friend B. And there's this wonderful, wonderful scene that does exactly what we're talking about, where A sort of lets her mind flow and have a, in, in fantasize sexually about a really polite orgy. <laughs> and what makes it great is that everyone's polite. You know, and, and so it's this really, situ it's, it's, it's a great example of like, I'm going to present to you a structure that you think you know, mm -hmm. and I'm going to destabilize it. And politeness is the destabilizer. And, it, and it's, it's the best. I, like, I, I read it, and then I was just sort of like, this is great. And then I read it out loud to my wife. And then I read it again. It was, yeah. So I, I think destabilization is, is just a, um, it's something, as a writer, I'm always looking for. Uh, and, I, and I sort of write into really familiar territory, thinking, like, you know, when can I pull out the, the tablecloth, you know? Yeah, and I think one great example of that, like a hilarious sort of running joke that also had this really poignant emotional dimension was your relationship with your mother, who's also sick, and you're kind of competing um, to be sicker, competing for the spotlight in yes. some ways. Um, and you have this phrase, the best sick person. <laughs> um, <laughs> could you tell me more about that? Yeah. I mean, it often felt to me um, that we were both kind of... Uh, these old vaudevillians, and uh, I was sleight of hand because I was just this this machine of defense mechanisms. Where my mother, she approached her illness just head on. She was just like, "I am miserable, and this is horrible." And she was like one of those people who just stood in front of a cannonball and just took it right, you know, in the body. So like, you know, we were part of the same show. We were just different acts. Uh, and and once I kind of realized that, it we uh, it became interesting. And my mother and I have always been like really competitive, and um, <laughs> no, I really mean it. I mean, I was, I was, you know, I, I was an RC kid when I was young, and that got mistook for a lot of things, and I got my ass kicked a lot. And my mom would just set me aside and be like, "You can't get your ass kicked like this." And she's a really small woman, and then she would just make me slap box with her, um, <laughs> and just really hit me, like you know. <laughs> And it made you have this choice, like, well, and she would be like, fight back. And then you have to be like, okay, so how, how hard am I going to hit my own mom? You know, and so it, it was sort of coded into our relationship in a lot of ways. And, it, and so when it came time for us to both be sick together, it just makes total sense that, you know, that we would be like, well, I'm better sick than you are. Um, and it really is just how we do it. Uh, it, it you know, she very recently had, a, had, a, had another operation and, you know, the very first thing she said whenever I, like, visited her, and she was just, she was like, you need to get this test done and this test done because you're up next. And I'm like, oh, you just got out of the operating room. Um, yeah, so it never ends. Uh, and I, and I, think, I think one of my hopes in writing about it was to call it what it was in a way that we can begin to talk about it helpfully, um, which I hope is happening now. I can never really tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, in terms of talking about it more helpfully, um, do you feel that you speak about your experience with this illness any differently since you wrote this whole book? Yes. Do you introduce it to people differently? Do you see your own story differently? Yeah, totally. Um, the one thing, I feel like destabilization is the theme tonight. So the one thing you start to realize is, and it's true with every illness, is that it produces its own unique universe of people that surround it. You are at the center, and it puts you in this 
really amazing position of control where you can do whatever you want with the people that surround you. Um, and when you have something happen to you, it's very, while you're very young, it's the, ten the tendency, at least for me, was to abuse that control um, in the ways that I write about in this book. And uh, as you get older, you, you just start to empathize more with, with people. Uh, you know, there is a friend of mine who a couple years ago had a really awful thing happen to him, where he was, uh, he was in a boat in a lake just reading on uh, a canoe, and a 17-year-old who had sort of stolen his parents' speedboat sort of cut him off and uh, blew through the boat, and my friend lost his leg. And I remember hearing about it and having the exact kind of reaction that I had sort of skewered in here. And all I wanted to do was just sort of call him and be like, please put me to work. I'll do whatever. You know? And his reaction almost immediately, while he was in the office, uh, hospital, while his leg was being amputated, was to post pictures of peg legs to Facebook. <laughs> you know? And I felt so angry. I, like, I felt so angry and helpless, and I felt like he was being really irresponsible with my concern, and then I sat and went, oh, this is how every single person in my life felt for like a decade, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it really sort of, you know, it really, it really sort of changed. And, I, and as I become um, more a part of the pituitary abnormality community, I start to realize that uh, a lot of people struggle in much worse ways than I do. Uh, so you know, the way to have the authentic conversation is, is, is to not one-up anyone, you know? Um, and I'm just trying to learn to, to exist in, the, in those spaces a little bit more authentically and honestly uh, and empathetically, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I mean, I can see that in this book, too. You have yourself as a younger person just finding out about this, mm -hmm. and you have yourself as an older person sort of um, watching each new development in the illness sort of yeah. reveal itself before you. Like, um, that's something I like about the title, The Brand New Catastrophe. It's sort of one catastrophe, but it's also sort of an, a new disaster every time something <laughs> <laughs> happens. And um, one of the things that your story about your friend with the peg leg points to, I guess, for me, is um, this difficulty separating yourself from the illness, right? So there's this wonderful scene in this book where um, you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're telling your wife, like, do you see it? Do you see that's, that's the acromegaly in my temple, that's a, in my face? Um, and she just sees you, right. you know? Um, but w whether it's your face or whether it's now the illness's face is something you actively struggle with. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a struggle that never ends. I was hoping you'd bring this up. Um, and there's a reason for it. And I'll get to, hopefully I get to it in a minute if I don't talk away from it. Um, but yeah, so the, the most difficult thing is somebody goes, well, you look like this now. And you're like, oh, I, no, I just look like me. And then it takes you to this real stoned grad schooler place where you're like, well, am I me or am I my, my body, you know? Um, and it really tends to infect, you know, in, in the first thing everybody does when, 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 you know, when they find out or when they, they inform you that, that, that you have acromegaly is, you know, go Google it. And that's horrible. Don't ever do that because there are people who have had it for like 50 years who, whose bodies have really been ravaged by it. And it just takes you down a rabbit hole of... of, of Things that really tend to confuse your own image and in your in your own feeling about that image as it's connected to it, um, and I feel like I'll always be asking myself, you know, what would I? It's like a flashpoint that creates this whole other timeline of mm. what would have I looked like had I not had this tumor, um, and you're always sort of comparing what you do look like to an imaginary image of yourself. And the imaginary image is almost more powerful than the real thing. Um, and you're always sort of measuring the distance. In your novel, you do something really fantastic with this, where um, uh, the narrator's friend B sort of socially pressures the narrator into giving her a makeover in the narrator's image. And it's one of those moments where 
I read that and I was like, wow, we're shopping in the same store here, you know, <laughs> but you're buying totally different things. And it, like, if you guys, it, it's, just, it's crazy. It's just somebody's monologue while they're drawing themselves on somebody else's face, which is early on in the novel. So as it goes on, it gets even crazier and better. Um, but I was just sort of like, this is just like the scene that you brought up where, where it's this endless sort of disembodiment that happens fr by the body, which is, it's crazy. It's betrayal yeah. in this strange way. Yeah, I yeah and, and that like um, your body so little that is up under your control, really. Like yeah, you can yeah. consciously make some choices about it, but all, the, all at the same time, it's changing itself like behind your back. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another bodily so good metaphor. luck looking in the mirror later, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that um, my friend who I think I may have introduced you to, who also has a similar um, pituitary disorder mm -hmm. said this book really captures is the sense that um, your experience is so continuous to you. You don't see these small changes in it when they're happening, um, and you only see them when someone points them out to you, when, when something breaks and there's a catastrophe and you right. have to figure out why it happened. Um, did that make it difficult to go back and tell the story, to tell the story of the times when you didn't know that you had this, but you still need to marshal um, an explanation of where it came from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think it's probably one of the things that anyone who writes a memoir sort of contends with. Um, and uh, it's really hard uh, because what you need to do in those moments, and almost every memoir does this to a certain degree, is you need to dramatize a blind spot that mm -hmm. you've had, which is really difficult to do. Um, I think a book that does this really well is uh, Darren Strauss's Half a Life, where uh, there's a really horrible thing that happens in the beginning and it keeps sort of returning into his life in a way that, 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 that sort of challenges what he does and doesn't see mm -hmm. about it. Um, and that was really helpful to me to sort of go back and sort of make the case for myself as somebody who was ignorant to what I saw every single day, which in the authority game is, it's really hard, that's a really hard sell as a writer, you know, to just be like, and I remember my early drafts of it, you know, in, in the wonderful workshop comments uh, that you that you get, people would just be like, I don't buy it. <laughs> I don't buy it. And you're like, no, no, it's usually diagnosed with people 49 to 53, and they're like, nope, don't buy it. And uh, so you got to go back to the drawing board and really see, start to think about what it meant that you didn't see yourself, which sucks to think about. Um, and hopefully after trial and error, you finally, you finally kind of get it. And I think when I finally figured out that I can treat myself as a dispatcher of my own story and sort of rely on the tools of journalism to create mm -hmm. that authority, that's when I found my entryway in. And I could right. sort of report out, this is what I found out, here's what I'm unsure about, that kind of thing. Right. Um, well, yeah. I mean, because it's such a rare disorder, too, um, and you've talked about that, you're sort of the expert on it. You're at least the complete and ultimate number one expert of your own experience right. of this, right? Um, so has it been hard to take on that kind of expertise? Yes. Yeah. Next Do question. Do people ask you for help? <laughs> well, <laughs> so it's, it's been less than a year since a number of this stuff has been being published in places where people um, frequently read. Uh, and so I had... I had a small sort of uh, excerpt of this come out in the New York Times uh, six or seven months ago. Um, and it was the first time, it was related to, to um, the fact that I don't have any hormones. And as a result of that, I don't have the stress hormone, cortisol, that a lot of people have, which means that I don't have a fight or flight response, which also means that any stressful situation can send me into something that's called adrenal crisis, uh, where my circulatory system shuts down and sort of mimics a stroke and I die. Um, that's, the, that's the Cliff Notes version of how I die. Uh, and, and so what's that, what, what's, what that's meant on a very sort of local level is that the kind of work I like to do, I often can't do because it's stressful. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a piece about it. I sent it out to the world. And it was on the business page. And uh, I was the business section or whatever it is. I don't know. Uh, I don't read it. <laughs> uh, I'm a, yeah, I'm a writer. I, uh, we have no business opportunities. 
<laughs> so I started getting these messages from people, and a lot of people who were, who were struggling with hypopituitarism and, 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 and more acutely struggling with, with cortisol deficiencies and, and asking me, like, how do you do this? And I was like, I don't know. Um, and then I got a message through Facebook from somebody who worked at Facebook, like really high up, who was like this brown grad who was, you know, information sciences specialist who was like, Mike, I read your article, I work for Facebook, I'm super smart. <laughs> um, what, you're, what you're describing here is not what's supposed to be happening. And I was like, well, I got it all wrong. It's that sort of thing that I was talking about earlier, where I'm not comfortable with the information, and I wasn't comfortable. You know, I, I had some reservations about being a spokesperson, uh, especially for a really rare condition, um, and not being connected to the community or knowing the language of that community. And so I thought, oh, shit. You know, this really smart person who, had, who I found out had actually written about not having any uh, hormones was calling me out. But what was really happening there and what I learned about the community at that time was that uh, what she was saying to me was that my doctors weren't leveling me properly. Mm -hmm. And so we went back on a couple emails and she was like, you need to have this conversation with your specialist and you need to do this and you need to do this. And I was like, oh shit, that's great. And I had that conversation. It's been really great since. Um, and what I slowly realized about the community was that everybody has a different relationship with the same exact illness. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of sort of self-regulation because stress is something that's deeply personal and what triggers it is deeply personal. And so it's been hard to know where to stand as somebody who's writing about this and representing a community because they are all individuals. Um, I'm part of some adrenal insufficiency groups on Facebook, and I'm astounded at what triggers adrenal crisis and, 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 and what I find stressful and what other people don't. Right. Um, rarely do our notes match up. So it's, ma it's made it a real challenge. But it's also so great that through writing about this, you can find other people who can tell you, oh, it doesn't have to be that inconvenient. Like, oh, here's yeah, something yeah. I do. Here's, yeah. Yeah, no, that, it's, it's been great. Um, and it's something that I'm still just sort of dipping my toes in. Um, and uh, I'm being really careful about where I tread there. And I, and I don't want to overstep and be like, I wrote a book about this. Um, but you did write a book about this. Yeah, I know. It's, it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm still figuring it out. So I have some events in D.C. next uh, week, and uh, the, the, the pituitary community is strong in D.C. They're, they're taking me out to dinner. So I, 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 uh, I, I suspect I'm going to learn a lot from that event. Yeah. So. Well, it's kind of a good segue into my last question before I open things up to other questions. Okay. Um, you were writing this book in sort of a very diff different political climate, right? Yes. Obviously now um, uh, the Affordable Care Act is under threat. And how do you see your book um, meaning something different in this yeah. climate? I've had to contend with that question in a way that I wish I didn't have to. Um, while I was finishing the, uh, this sort of home stretch of the book, the ACA was made into law. And my initial reaction was like, good, this is going to be a relic of a, a time that should have never been, you know, where, you know, when, when this happened to me, I didn't have insurance. Uh, and I lived. <laughs> and I lived because of my privilege. And I lived because there, uh, the way I existed at that time, I benefited from the help of a lot of people um, and, and my in the way I did eventually get covered was in a way that a lot of people don't. So um, I was very cognizant of that while I was writing about it. And I was thankful that the ACA got passed so that, that, that we can talk about it as this thing that is no longer this sort of white hot concern. I remember those years as being just <coughs> ruled by this fear of I could lose my job and I won't be able to go up to my specialists every six weeks to get the shot that I need to level my IGF-1 count so that I don't, you know, flatten out. You know, if I don't get my cortisol every day, what happens if I, you know, and the job market wasn't great in the early 2000s. And it was, you know, it was this whole sub-concern. And it breaks my heart that it might be back again. Um, and I, I don't quite know what to say other than, you know, if you're having these issues, 
uh, just to be as loud as humanly possible about it. The thing that is different now than was different than, than what was true in 2002 are that there are many megaphones. Um, and you can speak into them and, and arrange a situation for yourself that's alternative. You know, people will respond. Crowd funders will, will fund your, your efforts and, 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 and link you to opportunities to get alternative treatments, which I also benefited from when I was, uh, when I was first diagnosed. Um, the people who are supposed to step up likely won't, but the conditions now are much better if you're on your own to seek out people who will. So I would encourage anybody who sort of encounters this situation to just be loud and never shut up. I think that's an amazing note to end this on. Yeah, thank you so much. Right. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to open it up to the crowd. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask Mike? No? Can we get out of here? <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Um, we're, uh, first of all, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> it's great. I haven't read it yet, but I can't wait. And uh, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, about the time while you were in the process of writing it or trying to get it out there and struggling. Like, uh, what kept you going? Like, what kept? I know that it was a long journey. Oh, the writing of the book? Yeah. Yeah. Getting out there, like, what kept you coming back to the table I, and taking those steps forward? Sure. Um, first, before I answer this, the person asking a question is Catherine Capon. She was last year's winner of the Christopher Doheny Prize, so <laughs> we're both here. Her book is wonderful. It, you know, you'll be able to see it soon enough. Um, it, ew, I don't know, man. I just, I felt like the story kept getting in my way. I felt like I had other plans, and any time I tried to pursue those plans, uh, my dumb old brain tumor would just step in front of the camera and be like, nope, here I am. Uh, so it was strange. It, 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 it was very magnetic. I would, regardless of whatever project I tried to embark on, I got pulled over to this direction, this story, um, in a way that was completely inescapable. Um, and so when I say that I was a reluctant memoirist, I very much was. I was just sort of like, no, I don't know. I, and, and it required me to write it. And it had a grip on me that I felt like if I didn't finish this book, that it would, it would just be the only thing I focused on for years and years and years as a writer. And, um, and I was a writer before this happened, and it was very frustrating for me. So it felt very much like I was on a mission to extinguish the story, um, where it was just sort of like, I'm fine, I'm going to get it out, and then we're done. And I'm never going to have to talk about it with anyone ever again in a room <laughs> at the Center for Fiction. Um, no, so that, it, like, it was very much like, like I, I needed it gone, uh, was the motivation. I don't know how accurate that is, but uh, it, it was never something I was in love with, and my wife can tell you that. I mean, we had many talks where she was just sort of like, is this good for you? Because you're just constantly, like, stewing in the most miserable moments of your life all the time and trying to figure it out. And my answer was always no, <laughs> you know? Um, so we got through it, uh, and so I finished the book. I, you know, as I said, his, his ACA sort of came into law, which first happened in 2012 and then again in 2015. Um, so I finished it in 2012. Uh, my agent at the time was, was excited about its prospects, and we sent it out into the world. And the world was like, cool, we're good. Uh, we do not need your book. Uh, <laughs> and so at the time, at the time I, I was really, uh, you know, I would just say this. Whenever a manuscript fails, what happens is all the people in the writing community who have had failed manuscripts quietly come out of the woodwork, <laughs> and they contact you, and you create the secret network of people who are like, I wrote a failed book, too. <laughs> um, and so you feel really good during this time that, that you're heartbroken because this thing that you spent very uh, many years working on uh, just didn't work out. But then that quickly gave way to a kind of freedom that I'd wanted from the, the start. I was like, well, I wanted to write this to extinguish it, and I have. So I went to work on, on projects that I was really energized by, and, uh, and that really, um, I was really happy about it. And I was moving along, and I, I, had, I had left the story behind, and then the Christopher Doheny Prize came along, and, and we got back together.
<laughs> Anyone else? Yes, Patricia. What is um, the, mo the best advice or the most helpful change that your editor had? Oh, man. Well, she's sitting right behind you. So <laughs> um, I think, I think uh, the most valuable thing for me about the, the writer-editor sort of relationship is uh, not just new eyes, but, uh, but an attuned sensibility that's fresh. And what I liked best about my editor partnership was how keenly she saw whenever I worked redundantly. And what I mean is, is you know, when you write a book about defense mechanisms, you perform these things all the time, you know, which, which means that dramatically you're just performing the same action over and over again. And I wrote these scenes because they were either funny or they you know, communicated a kind of expository information. And then my editor would just take a look at the dramatic progression of those things uh, and, and say, nope, you've already done that work. Psh, get it out of there. And so, and, and so we did. And it was so, so helpful to have somebody who was attuned to that part of the book. Uh, you know, I talked about blind spots, and that was a major one. And it was really helpful to, to have an editor work with me on that. Um, but there are a ton of other things. I mean, we ended up cutting like something like 17,000 words from the book. And if I had it my way, we'd cut 17,000 more. Like, uh, it, it was just great to have somebody who wasn't afraid to slash and burn, you know, uh, <laughs> to sort of take my sentences and, and, and really make sure that they were doing the most organic work that they could. Um, and, and I don't think that that was the case. Uh, with the manuscript whenever my edit editor got it. So it was really great to have somebody who was extremely hands-on and who wasn't afraid to make sure that this, what was on the page worked for the reader, not for me. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think up here we had a question. No. Two quick questions, please. Sure. Number it's a one. double question. <laughs> it's a double question. I'm excited. Here All right. Number one, what did you write about prior to the book? Sure. And the other one is, um, Uh, press uh, called Sarah Band Books. Say again. Sarah Band Books. Okay. I mean, I know I can look up the book. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Band Books. Yeah. Okay. Number two, what is your favorite book? Oh, good question. So, what about the first one? What did you write about? Yeah. Uh, so, I was a sort of um, I was a sort of low level journalist for hire. Um, when I was in college, I you know I studied I, I studied uh, literary fiction and, and screenwriting and all that fun stuff. But I also worked at a regional magazine where. Uh, where I would do feature writing, and, and I was also a fact checker. Um, and I wrote for alternative weeklies where I would do you know, album reviews and websites and that kind of thing. It was really, I was just kind of, a, I was just a stringer, you know what I mean? And I really liked the idea of just being like, a, just like an arts writer. Um, it's really what I wanted to do. Uh, I, I moved here to New York City uh, totally with that in mind. And I was like, there's a million magazines. Nothing's ever going to happen to magazines. Um, and you know, I, I just thought that I'd roll right into that. Uh, I was lucky to work as a journalist through college, uh, as an undergrad, um, and I, you know, I had almost no interest in anything other than working as a journalist. Uh, and then this happened to me, and I needed to get coverage in a job. Uh, so the shape of my writing career changed, uh, and. It took me in, in this direction that led me to this book, but um, I, you know, I've always loved fiction. I've always, I always really loved really snappy magazine journalism, the kind of stuff you see in Esquire or, uh, you know, Vanity Fair, just you know, just really polished, tight work that kind of goes into the corners of culture and, and has some fun with it. And that's sort of uh, what I always wanted to write. What did you mean by new news coverage? Uh, health coverage. That's what I thought you were referring to. Yes. So at the time, you know, health coverage wasn't really easy to get as a freelancer. So um, I needed to get a job that had a health plan. Was this not then a precondition of pre-existing? Uh, I had a really particular insurance arrangement. Let's just put it that way. Some people, some people, some people cut me some slack, and, I, and I'm very thankful for it. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Awesome. Great. Yes. Um, in the in the introduction, you talk about the 
introduction about Christopher Jones. Mm -hmm. There was a comment that he tried to be a, live as normal a life as possible or something like that. Um, you know, kind of maybe distance himself from being a sick person. And I, I guess I'm kind of interested in what your relationship is in comparison to that statement. Do you think you're that person too that you tried to distance yourself from your illness or have you embraced it more? Um, and you know, like in the same life, if your your faith changes, uh, I mean, I know it's different, but everybody's faith changes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and it's that's true. Life. <laughs> it's Maybe very true. Maybe not in the same way. <laughs> yeah. And you would think that that sort of would make the issue simpler, but it actually complicates it, because you're like, okay, what 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 is the authentic change in my face and what is the change that comes from my hormone condition? It really just kind of muddles it and makes it more complicated. Um, there was a time where I, where, I, where I didn't want to be identified as a sick person. Um, and I still have a part of me, you know, uh, that, that sort of bristles about the idea of, of, of being an avatar of illness. Um, for my particular illness, uh, because the culture's knee-jerk reaction is sort of is often so cruel um, and kind of thoughtless. Uh, and I know that sounds really harsh, but when you start to look at the way that, that Andre the Giant was treated while he lived and even after he died, he's now very literally the poster boy for pituitary abnormality in a way that's completely disembodied from who he was. Uh, if I were to ask anybody if, you know, anything about Andre the Giant in this room, you know, people would be like wrestler, you know? And so the hesitation I think I have of, of sort of identifying so closely with my illness is the hesitation I've had throughout, which is um, I want to find a way to do it that lets people know that, like, they're human. Like, acromegalics are just human people. And so often that, that means distancing yourself from, from, from that illness. Um, it's, it's a dance I'm still doing. And I'm still kind of trying to figure it out. Um, but I do want to enter in those conversations and, and hopefully, hopefully be a representative of, of my condition in a way that honors the people who have suffered for it, you know, and have had to sort of deal with um, what I would say was, a, was an unkind cultural conversation. Um, does that answer your question in any way? OK, great. <laughs> I have question right. answer anxiety. You want to wrap it up? Um, yeah, I think unless anyone has anything that's an emergency, we will move to <laughs> signings. <laughs> Anybody have any emergencies? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you guys for coming out. This thank awesome. you so much, Ryan.